Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. Bit of a thorny one this week because we are going to grasp the subject of whether the US dollar is the global choice of reserve currency. It may well be that right now, but is it going to be into the future? Lots of economics to unpack in here, and it may seem like a dry subject, but nonetheless, it's critically important for you to understand as a major part of the financial jigsaw puzzle. As always, take plenty of notes, but most importantly, make sure you take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Laurential. Thank you, Mr. Baxter. Now, we're going to challenge you today and get a little bit technical, although a bit of a pressing issue that may surprise a lot of our listeners out there. We're going to be specifically talking about the US dollar and whether or not it actually plays a role as the world's reserve currency anymore, yay or nay. Mm, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Big and, topic. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it's a big, big topic. And look, clearly the US dollar is the current global reserve currency. If we were to have our time over again or look at things today, would it still qualify? And I'm not so sure about that. And I guess we can explore some of that as we, we go through. So big topic. And I guess, you know, to an extent, this is a good intersection between economics and economic theory. And I guess the politics uh, of the day and the economic circumstances that we're now seeing. So, yeah, it's a really uh, good thought provoker, I hope. Well, which we did an episode on this, I guess, as a lead in a few weeks ago, economics versus politics, mm. which is really blown up. So if our listeners are listening to this, That's go true. and check that out first. That was on the on the property side, right? The, That's right. Yeah. So if we look at this, I guess, from a currency perspective, AB, I know we've, we've spoken of this before and you recently made a presentation at, at Bonn Uni, which went really well, by the way, is you spoke of the, the empire of the US being similar to the ancient Roman Empire, which I was quite perplexed with, but talk to us about what, what you mean by that. Oh, look, you know, lecturing at a university, I suppose I'm now a man of letters. I, I, the the, 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 the soundbite to that, I suppose, which is quite interesting. The one thing that we know from history is that we don't learn from history, <laughs> uh, which I guess is uh, an interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, tagline. And I remember uh, last year, uh, my wife and I, well, kids as well, actually, we were sat uh, in a little piazza in Rome overlooking the Pantheon, beautiful building, and uh, and obviously ancient Rome, 2,000 years old, and you just sat there looking at this thing that's still structurally standing today, an incredible piece of architecture, and in the middle of a world city that still functions around all this history, it's quite remarkable. And look, I'll be honest with you, I'd had a Negroni maybe too, so my recollection of the specifics on that conversation may be a bit loose, but <laughs> the, uh, and, and I think it was one of my kids said to me, he said, Daddy, why did, why, what, what happened to the Roman Empire? You know, they had all this and it's 2,000 years old, what, what, why did it stop? And it's like, Jeez, that's actually a pretty good question. And I, I, I had an idea, but I didn't really know. And that's something interesting in life. Everyone's got an opinion. Seldom is it based on facts. So I thought I'd do a little bit of a, a dig on it. And some of the major factors for the end of the Roman Empire, they had chronic inflation. They had an over-reliance on slave labor. There was the emergence of the Eastern Empire. Their cash supplies, their reserves had been depleted by a series of endless and pointless wars. And there were some challenges to their religious and cultural beliefs. And I suppose without drawing too long a bow and without being a student of history, you go, that's actually not that dissimilar to what we're seeing in the US insofar as we've got significant inflation. There's a real destabilization of the political process. Uh, you've had a number of wars that uh, endless drains on the coffers, whether that be financially supporting the war in the Ukraine or backstopping the Gaza or some of the other conflicts that the US has been behind really since the 50s. Um, the emergence of the Eastern Empire being being China, uh, a breakdown of cultural and religious values most definitely happening. And actually, you go, yeah, there's actually quite a few similarities there. So that sort of formed the, the, the sort of nexus of the argument. And, uh, and, and that's where it started. So how did the US become the world's base currency? Look, over the time, it's been Portugal, it's been Spain, it was the Netherlands, it's been France, of course, my home, Great Britain, an empire where the sun never sets uh, through the 1800s to, to the Second World War. But the US really became uh, the global uh, reserve currency in 1944. Uh, the the world was in disarray. It was in World War II. The US was largely, with a notable exception, of course, of Pearl Harbor and the horrific events there, was largely undamaged domestically. It wasn't attacked other than uh, the, uh, the attack in Pearl Harbor. Uh, and it created this war machine uh, that come the end of the Second World War needed to be put somewhere. And so instead of making military equipment, which they still continue to make, it still do to this day, they also started to manufacture a lot of other stuff too. Uh, and that was their way out of the Great Depression in the 20s. So all of a sudden, if you had any manufactured goods, if it was a TV, for example, which was brand new then, or a motor vehicle, or any other white goods or electrical goods, it was all, even watches, it was all out of the US. So it became this incredible manufacturing uh, hub, if you will, 
rather like China is now, uh, for the world. Employing its return servicemen, boom times. And if you if you kind of think back to the adverts, the Halcyon adverts of you know life in the U.S. in the '60s, you know the white picket fence and the suburban house and the new car and the barbecue outside and the kids playing on a trampoline, you know, it's idyllic lifestyle, land of opportunity, absolutely. Right? And that was what the U.S. was uh, until it wasn't. So what happened? So as you accumulate wealth as a country, uh, your wage costs start to move higher. People have a higher expectation of a higher standard of living and. After the war, the, 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 the rebuild countries, so a lot of the countries in Europe, including the UK, which you know, was savagely uh, uh, blown up uh, during the Second World War, Germany, Japan, um, started to re-emerge as they had new factories built and they started to become very competitive in the manufacturing space. And so that put a lot of wage pressure uh, against the US, just simplifying things a little, whereby manufacturing then started to shift to those rebuild economies. And then subsequently to that, moving out to other countries like Thailand and uh, Hong Kong and different places uh, in, in the Far East in particular, at the expense of US jobs. So you had a situation where it got to 1971, uh, where President Richard Nixon uh, decided that he didn't like uh, pegging. Um, for the currency, uh, which was at the time pegged against gold. The system was something that was called Bretton Woods, uh, where one US dollar, 35 US dollars, was one ounce or one troy ounce of gold. So it's pegged against gold standard. Which for perspective now is just shy of 2,000 USD a troy ounce. There's inflation for you, and we'll get on to talk about that in a minute. Um, And so they decided that it was too constraining for the economy. You had a trade deficit, and so being pegged uh, against the uh, the gold standard made the US dollar a little bit overvalued and hard to compete in the in the world marketplace that was then being dominated by countries in Asia and, and Europe for manufacturing. So the US actually had its first trade deficit in, in the early 1970s. Prior to that, it had been a net exporter throughout its history. And, and that deficit continued and they've never really recovered from it. So where do we stand now in 2023, of course, post the GFC, which is a huge, <laughs> yeah. major catastrophe we saw stem from the US, right? Yeah, so to offset the lack of exports, the US got into a very good export business, or at least initially it looked like it, which is called exporting debt. So if we've got to buy our goods and services from you in Japan or, or you in Germany, um, what we'll do to fund that, given the fact that we're not manufacturing stuff anymore and our economy is, is, is more in decline, we'll, we'll sell debt instead, which then gives us the money to, to be able to do that. So, so issue bonds, right? Treasury issue, bonds. Issue treasuries and away you go. And this is great scheme of, of printing money on the never never. Uh, and that's been running really ever since. It was really, I guess, 2008 and the GFC is where things sort of kind of went ballistic. It was like Popeye sort of getting on the spinach there, where all of a sudden to stimulate the economy, which was um, moving along, we've got to come up with an economic policy to to get us out of this GFC. What are we going to do? And someone uh, must have done a really good sales and marketing course somewhere on the line because they took a policy called inflation, let's print more money, which basically means inflation down the line, and call it something different because no one's going to want inflation. Let's call it um, quantitative easing. That sounds pretty intelligent. QE. So we're going to print money, which is inflationary, but we're going to call it quantitative easing and save the day. And so they did, and they have, and that's again a, a, a play that really hasn't stopped. It's gone through surges and slowed, but it hasn't stopped. And if you look at the the quantum of U.S. debt now, it's it, it it's just it, it's just off the dial. You were in New York last year, did you? I don't know if you saw the debt clock. I think it's like Forty Fifth Street somewhere around there. You can see it up on the wall, and you see that it doesn't fit on the wall anymore. It's quite ridiculous. Yeah, um, and so um, that takes us through to to, to 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 kind of where we are now, where you've got a situation where you've got significant inflation. Um, and and the, the net effect of printing all that money, of course, is your dollars aren't worth much anymore. You mentioned in passing that you know, a, a, an ounce of gold now is $2,000, used to be 35. So you can see the actual value of what you can buy for your dollar, which is typical of inflation. When inflation is high, you can buy less with your money. Your money is worth far less. Purchasing power is down. Um, that's pretty much precisely the situation you're in. So your dollars are worth much, much less now. The debt is through the roof. So if we if we look at the the three S's, I know we've spoken of before: stability, security, yep. and safety. You really need those three in conjunction with one another to have a functioning currency. Would you say the US is sits? Mm. So stability is that your dollars are going to be worth something, and if you've got more and more of them being printed, their value is being denigrated by inflation. So that stability is gone from being a yes in 1944 to not really now, in the current environment, 2024. If we then look at the risk of 
security default. You go, let's just acknowledge the elephant in the room. And obviously you guys listening to this can't see the charts going along this, but rest assured, if you could see the charts on where the US dollar debt actually sits, it's just this staggering number. And I guess the question you then have to ask yourself hard and fast is, does the US actually have the ability to pay that money back? Probably not. And, and the answer it. has to be no, it's just not possible. It's too much. And, and that's, a, that's, I guess, a notion that was picked up last year um, by the ratings agencies, you know, Fitch, Standard & Poor's, where they downgraded US government debt. The market ignored that, of course, uh, because you know, we're ignoring the elephant in the room that there's this enormous amount of money that's out on loan through treasuries. Uh, there's just no way you can pay it back. There's not enough money, print more money to do it and have more inflation, I suppose. Uh, and this notion of, of issuing bonds to, to, create, to create money, uh, the simple example of this, Mitch, the easiest way I can explain this to our listeners is that if you have a checking account, you've got a bank account that you can write checks on and you write yourself from your personal account a check for $1,000 and you put that check in your pocket. You haven't cashed it, but it's in your pocket. Are you better off? Do you have more? Do you have $1,000 more than what you did before? No, net, net, you're the same, right? The answer is no, you don't. You've got this check that's worth $1,000, which you can say, look, I've got $1,000 more here, but it will be debited from the bank account, taking it away from that side of the ledger. And this very simple analogy for economics is something that seems to be wasted on central bankers where issuing bonds is not an asset, it is a liability. Okay, and that, that's a major flaw. So the second S, stability, like the, the, the ability to not be defaulted, is your money safe? I think long term, I don't think we'll see it in our lifetime, I hope not. But there's a very good chance that the US defaults because it's not got the ability to pay it back. And I guess the third part of this and this breakdown um, of, of the, the government or, or stability within the country is the fact that the US government last year, oh sorry, two years ago now, weaponized US dollars. So Russia has a huge amount of US dollar reserves. But on the back of the invasion of the Ukraine, terrible as that was, the US government said, well, we're gonna, we are going to sanction and keep that money now. It's not yours anymore. So what you thought was safe and your US dollars, the world's global currency, is now being weaponized to say, if you don't toe the line from a foreign policy perspective, now may well be a good call to do that, not, not the role of this podcast to discuss it, we'll hold a gun to your head by saying, look, we're not going to militarily go to war with you, but we're going to take all your foreign currency reserves so you don't have them anymore. You don't get to use US dollars. Well, then you've got politics intersecting with economics once again, right? So those three things together, the, the, the fact that there's no way you can pay it off, the fact that the value of your dollars are denigrating over time because of inflation. And then thirdly, if you don't tell the line, they can be taken away from you are three crosses in those boxes of it being the global currency. Yet, what are the alternatives? And, and, and that in itself is a very, very difficult question to answer on what needs to change. Um, yeah, major different, major changes in the US, maybe a, a significant change in government and government policy. Uh, no politics in that just needs stronger leadership with some clarity and better economic policy that puts America first. Uh, and, you know, it's the unspeakable to say make America great again on a red baseball cap is possibly what that image might look like for many people. The other side of the coin is the pressure that we're seeing on the US dollar from this multipolar world that we live in now, where you know, you've got China and Russia, the empires in the East, which I suppose you could argue is the parallel with ancient Rome, where they're now trading partners on a significant scale. So Russia has a ban on its oil exports, so they sell it to China. China then sells it in the market uh, for US dollars uh, and, and away you go. So there's a very strong alliance there also with Brazil uh, and, and India, uh, amongst others, getting together to try and conduct trades in iron ore in Chinese renminbi as opposed to US dollars. Why would they want to convert to US dollars? China wants the iron ore, they'll pay Brazil in, 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 its, uh, in its renminbi currency, China's renminbi, cut out the US dollar, why do we need it? So you've got this axis of mischief that kind of sits in the middle there now, which is certainly gained strength. And all of those countries, whether it's Russia from a, a, an energy exports perspective or grains and food for that matter and, and other stuff to boot, or China, which is the world's manufacturing center now, or Brazil, which has, you know, again, iron ore particularly is, is one of its major um, exports, or India, the burgeoning billion dollar nation that's going on a growth tear right now. That's where the economic engine room of the world now sits. So wouldn't it make sense if the reserve currency related to that just in the same way that that's why the US got that coveted status of being the reserve currency and why Great Britain previously to that had it and why the Netherlands had it prior to that. And, and, and so it is a, a really interesting sort of tapestry, if you will, of history to get us to this point in time. 
So where do you go? Do you consider crypto? Do you consider gold? Once again, where, where do you actually go with this? Because it sounds like there's a lot of, rather than being one dominant player, there's a lot of players now, yeah. right? Look, I mean, China is probably the lead candidate. However, uh, and I don't think it's China's turn just yet. And I, I guess in the West, we're hamstrung by four year election cycles and government policy obviously is focused on how can I get reelected as opposed to what the greater good for your country might be. And I appreciate that may sound a bit cynical, but I think the results uh, and, and governance that we're seeing around the world probably validates that comment to some extent. Whereas in China, they're playing the long game. This isn't about four years or 10 years, it's 50 or 100 years and a dynasty beyond that. So China can wait it out. And maybe it's not their turn in the sun because they've got their own economic problems right now with you know, the implosion of the property uh, sector, uh, the slide into a recession. Um, they've got their own uh, consumer confidence issues there post, post their COVID lockdowns. Uh, but it is flexing its muscles militarily as well with some of its claims on land in the South China Sea and you know, rattling the say with Taiwan and so on and so forth. So maybe it's not quite their time now but they're possibly going to wait that out. Maybe reform become more transparent in what they do. Maybe move on human rights a little bit. And maybe 20, 30 years time, uh, when we go through the next cycle, it might be their turn. Between now and then, something that's certainly more topical would be crypto. Now, the challenge with crypto, of course, is unregulated, which I don't like. Uh, and it doesn't really do what people wanted, which is an uncorrelated asset that's an inflation hedge. It's neither of those things. But perhaps if we saw a return to some form of gold-backed crypto, where you've got a, a finite resource of something that's fungible, which is very important, um, that, that then gives a pegged benchmark for what that crypto is worth. And crypto is certainly easier to trade than, than a lot of other things. That may well be what comes in in this digital world. It's quite but interesting. I think, again, we're some way from that. But I guess the, the, the fundamental question is this. If you were to look at the US in its current state economically, would it constitute the values and attributes of a global reserve currency? Absolutely not. It's a legacy that it has right now. And I'm sure it'll be working hard to try and retain that legacy for as long as it can. Time for change, maybe in that instance, AB, because as you say, the points illustrate that that's probably where it needs to go. So quite interesting. It is, and it's one that's going to play out, maybe not in our lifetime, but it's certainly going to get quite heated because the US won't give that up anytime soon. So you can you can imagine the measures that might be applied uh, in order to try and retain that. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a very interesting one to watch. What's the impact on investors? Well, as that dial gets turned up, you're probably going to see a lot more weakness in the treasury market. As an example of that, you can see weakness in the US dollar, probably see a run in gold to the north side. Interesting. There you go. Great observations, AB, and you know, quite high level stuff we're talking of here, but our listeners do need to be aware because as always, there's an investment opportunity in there, as you just mentioned. Too true there is. Cheers, AB. Absolute pleasure. Anytime, Mitch. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit that notification button, and we'll look forward to hosting you next week.